Friends, good morning and welcome to this time of worship. So glad we can be together. Um, no real big announcements today. Just want to let you know if you weren't able to join us last Sunday for our fish fry rally day, sock collection, and whatever else we were doing, it was, it was just very, very nice. Apparently about 94 people, I think, was the count. Um, some activities for the little ones. And by and large, people just sat around and visited, and it was very, very nice. So we're going to be doing a bonfire come October, and hope if you weren't able to join us for this one, that you will join us for that as well. And there will be some more information about that. And with that, we'll begin our worship. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4 and 25 through 32. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Word of God, word of life. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. He was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for I'll regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But I, he did not. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw this, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. 
For the past 20 years, an organization called the Center for America has been holding a wackiest warning label contest. And the idea is to find the strangest and silliest product warning labels. For example, the warning on a bag of peanuts reads, warning, contains peanuts. Do not eat if allergic to peanuts. Another, do not use while driving. On a hands-free speakerphone called Drive and Talk. A decorative globe of the world warns us not to be used for navigation. So I guess we stick with GPS and Siri. The maker of an electric skillet reminds us that the product may be hot during cooking. And I'm thankful that makers of fishing lures caution me that they may be harmful if swallowed. And one of my favorites and previous grand prize winner, remove child before folding stroller. And how in the world did we get to a place where we've lost any kind of common sense? And actually, the, the warning labels have become something of self-protection for the companies being sued for misuse of their products. Before I went to seminary, I worked in a couple of different industries for five years. Um, and at one time, I worked as a claims adjuster. And when I was training, one of the examples of product liability that we studied was a man that picked up his lawnmower and used it to trim the hedges. As you might imagine, this didn't go well. He cut off part of his hand and sued the company. And the jury ruled in his favor, saying that that was a conceivable use for a lawnmower. And so, now everything including lawnmowers, have ridiculous warnings. Whatever the situation, it's not your fault. You are not responsible. And I don't think ever in the history of the world have so many people been responsible for so little. I have a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that I saved that really captures our time. The two are walking along and Calvin says, nothing I do is my fault. My family is dysfunctional and my parents won't empower me. Consequently, I'm not self-actualized. My behavior is addictive functioning and a disease of process of toxic codependency. I need healing and wholeness and wellness before I will accept my responsibility for my actions. I tell you, I just love the culture of victimhood. To which Hobb replies, I think that one of us may need to go soak their head. And that's not far from reality. We're quickly moving to a day where no one is the perpetrator and everyone is the victim. And as I say, it's amazing how little is our responsibility. And I could go on with examples, and I'm sure that you could add many of their own. Now, the blame game is, is nothing new. It goes back to the very beginning. The opening chapters of the Bible tell the story of creation the man and the woman are placed in the garden to care for it. They have peace with God, with one another. It doesn't take long, though, for things to begin to fall apart. We know the story of each of them eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once they have done that, their eyes are opened. And the first thing they want to do is to try to hide from God and one another. But God seeks them out. He comes and he asks them, what have they done? Where are you? What are you? Why are you hiding? And the responses are wonderful. The woman blames the serpent. Eve tells God, the devil made me do it. And Adam does her one better. He not only blames the woman for giving him the fruit, he blames God for making her in the first place. It's all your fault, God. So what do we do with the belief that says it's not my fault? What does scripture have to say about personal responsibility? Our first lesson for this morning comes from the book of Ezekiel. Now last week we saw how the story of Jonah is about much more than a whale or a great fish. And in the same way, I suspect that a lot of us don't know much about Ezekiel, except that he saw a wheel way up there in the middle of the air, and he had this vision of a valley of dry bones. 
But Ezekiel was called to speak God's word about five or six hundred years before the time of Jesus. And it was a difficult, difficult time in the life of the people of Judah. In 586 BC, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians. There'd been a long siege of the city. Many people have died of, of battle or, or disease. The king had been taken into exile. But first, the king of Babylon murdered his two sons and then blinded him before taking him into exile. A large number of people were taken into exile with him and they hoped that the king would live long enough that when they returned to Judah, he would be their king again. But he died in the exile. And so now people are wondering, how in the world did God let this happen? They were God's chosen people. They had been promised a descendant of David would be king forever. But now all of that had just been swept away. And so what had been gone wrong? Why did God let that happen? And there in the exile, people try to make sense of it. And apparently there were people that were starting to say that they were being punished for the sins of those who had gone before them. And that didn't seem fair. And Ezekiel is called to speak a word against that. And it's a powerful message. The word of the Lord came to me, he says. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and set the children's teeth on edge. And that is a great image. I remember one time when I was a little kid, six, seven years old, one of the neighbors had grape vines in their backyard. And, and I remember one time I got into a whole bunch of Concord grapes that weren't quite ripe yet. And I'll tell you what I learned about an hour later, what it means to have your teeth set on edge. And it gets your attention. But the people are complaining that God is unfair. You know, their ancestors, there's the ones that lived in the land. They're the ones that had turned away from God. But it's those that are coming after them that are bearing the pain. And God says, no, it's not that way. Don't use that proverb anymore. All lives belong to me. The life of the parent, the life of the child. And it's only the person who sins that shall die. And so God is calling people to personal responsibility. He's calling them not to blame, but to look at their own heart, their own actions, and to turn to God and live. Certainly Jesus reinforced personal responsibility. He account, uh, called people to accountability. At the same time, though, Jesus was often accused of being a friend to sinners. But as you see through, as you read through the Gospels, Jesus dealt with people in a very loving, but a very upfront way. You know, there's a beautiful story in John's Gospel where the religious authorities bring to him a woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. Don't know where the man is, but kind of a something that you're hard to do by yourself. But they're trying to track him, trap him. The law said that such a woman should be stoned to death. And Jesus doesn't dispute that. But he says to each of them, whoever is without sin, cast the fourth stone. And one by one, we're told, the religious leaders, from the oldest to the youngest, drop their stones harmlessly and walk away. But then Jesus turns his attention to the woman and speaks to her. But he doesn't say, you know, I know you had low self-esteem, your parents never loved you. He didn't say, don't worry, it's not your fault, it's not that big of a deal. Instead, he said, no, I do not condemn you either. I forgive you. Go and sin no more. And I hear that not so much as a warning, but as an invitation. There's another way to live. Go. Go and live. Jesus called people to deeper responsibility, deeper accountability, and the result was their freedom. Jesus takes personal responsibility, accountability, because he knows apart from that there is no life, there is no community. Now certainly there can be times when we're in the wrong place, the wrong time, and be victimized by, by something for which we have no responsibility. I mean, that's the case for those who are maybe killed in a terror attack or war, many crime victims. A number of years ago, I used to 
teach Sunday school at the, at the locked unit at the Berea Children's Home. And most of the kids there, I mean, they had just been abused in the most horrible, horrible kind of way you could imagine. I remember this one little girl, maybe six, seven years old, beautiful little red-haired, freckle-faced little girl, um, just smiled. And I was asking, you know, how she happened to be here. And it turns out she had been, you know, since almost birth, physically, sexually, emotionally abandoned, abused. And she burned the house down, six years old. You know, and you wonder, with what some people experience in life, will they be able to have any kind of life? There are true and genuine victims. But I'm talking about the attitude that you and I carry around often, that we will cast blame for anything. And so how did we get to a place where many people are unwilling to take responsibility for anything? And I want to share with you what I think the answer to, to that is and, and what it means. The Christian faith begins with the assumption that you and I have been created by God. And not only created by God, but we are also responsible to God. God is the creator. We are the creation. God is the CEO. We are the workers. And God has a plan. And that is that we would live our life giving glory to God. And the way that we would do that is by loving and serving other people. And the goal is that we would live together in community. That's what broke down in the garden. We came indifferent to God, and we now live to serve ourselves. And that's true for us today. We live in a society that in many ways gives lip service to God, but lives for self. And it's really that whole attitude, hey, it's all about me. And when we do that, two very interesting things happen. First, our focus moves from our neighbor to ourself. And second, our focus moves from our responsibilities to our rights. When I was living in Atlanta about 25 years ago, there was an editorial one day that I thought was just so right on. I read it, saved it, just put it so well. And the author said, we live in a new era with a new attitude. The old attitude built on responsibility seems to have been replaced by a new outlook based on rights, entitlement, and the casting of blame. When your attitude is grounded primarily in responsibility, your major emotion is guilt in the desire to fe avoid feeling guilty. This motivates you to act responsibly, even at the expense of your own personal interest. On the other hand, if your attitude is based primarily on rights, your major emotion is anger and the desire to avoid having your rights infringed upon. And this motivates you to strike out and demand recognition for your individual interests. And I think the author was, was just so correct in saying that the shift has gone from responsibilities to rights and from guilt to anger as the major emotion in our society. But I think there's something even deeper going on here. As I say, you and I have been made and created by God. We answer to God. And so we can't escape our responsibility, our accountability to God, no matter how we hard we try. And I believe that's a large part of the reason why we try to avoid responsibility, why we are so quick to blame, because we don't know what to do when we fall short. You know, the scriptures, time and time again, call us to acknowledge, not to avoid responsibility. And there's a theological term for that avoidance. It's one we all know, sin. And that's what's going on in the story of Adam and Eve. It's not so much the eating of the fruit, you know, it's about what happens afterwards. It's about the denial of responsibility. It's a trying, trying to place blame somewhere else. And that attitude, that sin has permeated our world, our thoughts, our actions. Sin is bad news, but there's also good news. In fact, there's great news. 
And this is where the Christian faith stands alone. Most every religion has moral codes, ethical teachings. Every society does as well. The world is up to its eyeballs in rules. What is unique about the Christian faith is what it does when we fall short. The good news is what God does with our guilt and our shortfalls. As I said earlier, Jesus didn't go around saying, hey, don't worry about it. It's not your fault. Rather, he said, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life in all its fullness. And that life is not found in freedom from responsibility. Rather, that life begins in forgiveness and reconciliation. And here's where the world has it so desperately wrong. Because the world says that the way to be free is to not be responsible for anything. And forgetting all the ridiculous examples, why do we buy that? Why do we so often avoid taking responsibility for our mistakes, our shortcomings? Why do we cover up? Why do we want to pass blame? Why do we find it difficult to take responsibility? Well, when you take God, when you take the possibility of grace and forgiveness out of the picture, something changes. And I think it's really a, a, that avoidance is, is a form of self-protection. Listen, see if this sounds like anything familiar. I don't want to accept responsibility. I don't want to acknowledge that something was my fault. If I did, I would be guilty. If I'm guilty, then I must have done a bad thing. And if I did a bad thing, I must be a bad person. And if I'm a bad person, no one will trust or respect me. If I am a bad person, no one will love me. And if I'm not trusted, if I'm not loved, I don't know how I'll live. And you know, if I'm real honest, I see myself in those words. I think about the closest relationships in my life and all the times I say, you know, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't do it on purpose. I had a bad day, it's not my fault. All the little ways I try to avoid responsibility and blame, not of, out of arrogance, but out of fear. You know, what if I admit I'm wrong? Will I still be loved? And we worry about that because we know that sometimes the world will take one mistake and use it against us and never forget. The world rarely forgives and virtually never forgets. Nowadays, you can put something on the internet and it'll come back to haunt you 20 years later. The world does not know forgiveness. It kicks you when you're down. And here's where Jesus and the world are so totally different. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, carrying burdens, I will give you rest. Jesus gives us a place to go with our sin and our guilt. Jesus welcomes forgives, eats with sinners. Jesus welcomes, forgives, eats with you and me. And we need to hear that because it's not just people that we judge to be bad that do bad things. People we label good do bad things too. You and I mess up. And I would imagine that every one of us have in one place or another, we've looked back and said, you know, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe that happened. God's love isn't based on goodness. God's love is based on a place, giving us a place to go when we fall short. In the last verse of our reading from Ezekiel, God says, why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Turn then and live. In Jesus, we see that not only does God not desire the death of anyone, but on the cross, he takes our death, that we might live, that we might be free. As Christians, we can take responsibility because Jesus takes away our sin. And so this morning, I'd ask you, where do you find yourself avoiding responsibility? Where do you try and shift blame? Where do you cover up and hope not to be discovered? 
Where do you pretend to have it all together but are secretly afraid it's all coming apart? Jesus has come to set you free, not by blessing your avoidance or blaming. Jesus sets you free when you come before him and say, you know, it really was my fault. And he says, I know. I love you. I forgive you. In all kinds of ways, the world urges you and I to play the blame game. The world teaches us the art of shifting responsibility. The world tells us that the way to be free is to be accountable to no one. But in the end, those things only enslave and push us farther and farther away from God and one another. When you know Jesus, you know better. You know that forgiveness is the name of the game and that it's the only one worth playing. For Jesus' sake, amen. together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy. Your Son took on all of bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged, so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Turn the nations toward life, where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority. Lord, in your mercy. Our lives are yours, O oh God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. 
defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Lord, in your mercy. Turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interests of others. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy. Bless ministries of care in our community. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us, tax collectors and prostitutes, likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our offering comes where it does in the service because it's our response to the, to the promises of God that we hear in scripture, that we hear in, in sermon. And so as, as we consider our, our financial gifts to the church, I'd also ask you to just be always mindful. What can I offer in terms of my words, my deeds? Um, what can I give to God that will honor him in, in ways that I, I love and serve my neighbor? So as we hear our, our offering music, I'd ask you to please remember to, to mail in an offering um, or to use the, the website. So thank you very much. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. He revealed himself to us in his teachings from a mountaintop as he told us what it means to be blessed. Humbled and empowered by his words, we gather to follow and to serve. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. pray. Holy, mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit that by this Holy Communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Friends, come to the banquet table, where Christ gives himself as food and drink. And following the Lamb of God, I'll invite you to receive the body and blood of Christ. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Mother in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you in the way of truth and life. 
Amen. God.